Well, thank you very much. And uh, uh, I too am thrilled to be here. It's a beautiful venue. And uh, I'm really glad to see some familiar faces in the room. Uh, thank you for attending this morning. So I'll, um, I'll walk you through some of this, uh, the more uh, concrete part of uh, what's the implication of an aeration system is the power bill. And uh, for quite some time, Mike and I have been working on this, testing in the field, testing in the lab. But at the end of the day, you as an operator or a consulting engineer, well, you have money is the bottom line, right? And so you have uh, on one side, the capital cost, the installation. The other side is the operating cost. And so if you're an operator, you will see the power bill coming at the end of each month if it, the plant is small. If the plant is really big, the, that power bill goes downtown and you have really no feeling of how much you're spending. So there are a number of techniques, including off gas, that uh, you should be aware of. So you, at least you can you know, uh, keep control over how much power you're using, your expenditure, and you can you know, take credit for reducing that. So I'll... Uh, I'll start reviewing very briefly what the terminology, you see a lot of acronyms throughout the day and uh, I'm not sure if this is uh, available to the public, this uh, PowerPoint? Yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll distribute uh, the PowerPoint. So you can use this slide here as your cheat sheet, okay? And uh, you'll see, all right, okay. So the oxygen transfer efficiency is the number that you get when you measure it in the field. That's uh, you go to the field and you measure this number which is valid for this condition right now, today, in this plant. And then, uh, this is your design uh, target. This is how much uh, mass of oxygen you need to deliver per unit time to meet your oxygen demand, right? So your oxygen requirements. So uh, when you design the plant, you design for this required OTR plus a safety factor that you feel comfortable with, and you go to the field and it is the oxygen transfer efficiency associated with it. Thank you. Then you standardize these values in clean water when you do a clean water test, and this is what the manufacturer does. The manufacturer, according to a protocol with some witness, will uh, provide you some uh, numbers that they, they feel comfortable giving you a warranty for. And those are the clean water tests. And those are standard oxygen transfer efficiency. The oxygen transfer efficiency is the number you measure at any given time. So in clean water, it's a standardized value because uh, clean water is just devoid of contaminants. And you can uh, standardize it to 20 degrees, one atmosphere, zero DO, zero salinity. And then you go to the field and uh, all sorts of things happen. There is, uh, Whenever you don't need, you put it down a toilet, right? So you go to the field and you have all sorts of contaminants you can think of in the wastewater. And that's why we came up with the BOD test and the COD test a long time ago to qualify how much is it? Because we don't have enough time to tell people what is it? Our job is to get rid of it. So we quantify how much is it? So not knowing the quality becomes a big problem because we don't know what's in the wastewater. You know how much it is, and your job is to remove it in quantity, not in quality, okay? To meet the territory rule or whatever other NPDES permit you might have. So we have to come up with a, a factor that will tell me how much is uh, the effect of this contaminant on the oxygen transfer efficiency, because as Tom said, we're not treating tap water, we're treating wastewater. So you need to scale down the performance from tap water. And here comes in alpha, which, uh, uh, predicting alpha uh, is rather impossible because you don't know what the effect of wastewater will be before you put in the diffuser in the wastewater. But you put in the wastewater, you measure it, and then you take that number and you ratio it to the number you previously measured in clean water, and you can calculate the alpha. Okay? So alpha becomes a water quality estimate because it's the ratio of the process water efficiency to the clean water efficiency. So over time, you expect the efficiency of the diffusers to go down. It's inevitable. It's an inevitable condition of anything that is engineered. You know it. You buy a car and it runs very well when it's brand new, and over time you lose a little bit of its efficiency, right? It's just inevitable. So over time we calculate this, uh, or we measure the alpha over time, or the alpha SOT, which is uh, the product of alpha and the clean water, okay? So that's the, your design value, alpha SOT. You measure it on day one when it's brand new, and then you start measuring it every three or six months, every year, every two years. And you see a curve of alpha going down, or alpha SOT going down. And so the ratio of these values to the initial one, we call it the fouling factor, F. And it, it, the initial value, by definition, is 1.0. And over time, it can stay close to 1.0, or it can go below 1.0. So your job is to also be aware of the fact that when you design a system, or when you own a system, it's size not for day one, but it's size to last for a few more years, okay? Just in case, because uh, what if uh, your uh, efficiency is much, much lower in two years from now? 
well, your power bill is going to go up. But that may not be just the only problem. You might have a limited ability to dissolve oxygen, to supply the oxygen to meet your treatment needs. So you might have a very limited capacity in your system. So your, your design engineer will design the system that is larger than needed for the initial day, so you can actually continue having enough oxygen throughout the lifespan of this installation. And when you look at a diffuser, the head loss across that diffuser, we call the DWP, the dynamic wet pressure. The head loss across the diffuser, it's a very important parameter because the way you select a blower, you don't pick a blower based on its size. First of all, you need to make sure you can discharge air full stop. And if you don't have enough pressure at the outport to the blower, the air won't come out because blowers, well, they cannot compress the air, they blow it. If you put the end, if those of you who use a hair dryer, okay, if you put your hand at the end of it, okay, it just keeps spinning, it doesn't push your hand off. So if you don't have enough discharge capacity in terms of pressure, the air won't come out. Once you selected that pressure, then it's time to size the size of the blower. Okay? So we need to know what is the discharge pressure at the beginning so you can budget enough pressure. And over time, this discharge pressure will, may creep up. If it does creep up, at some point you may limit the ability for your blower to discharge air because you may touch that ceiling that you really don't want to be at. So you need to be able to understand how much that is likely to go up. So when you size the blower today, you have that spare extra pressure that you, that you have budgeted for to meet the discharge sometimes in the future. So when I went to college, I, you know, Mike used to explain always in class that alpha is the mother of all fudge factors. And I really believe it because it, ju it just includes everything we don't understand about wastewater because we cannot know beforehand what's in the wastewater. By the time we find out, the wastewater is long gone in the ocean. So, Alpha becomes this uh, scaling factor that it just tells us what is the difference between oxygen transfer coefficient, which it's called KLA in chemical engineering, is the oxygen transfer coefficient in clean water and the one in processed water. So it, it's, you scale it down to a certain value that is below one. Now, in the manufacturer will give you a, a, a number that is the SOT, the clean water value of oxygen transfer efficiency. And that's saying so much percent per foot of depth. So your job as a design engineer or as an operator is to, to put up with the product of the two because that's your operating efficiency at any po given point. So if you look at a, a blower curve, okay, and a blower, um, a blower uh, equation where you have the airflow rate of the blower, the size of the blower now, not just the pressure, but the size of the blower, the, which will largely dictate the blower power requirements, so your power bill. This uh, blower size is a function of the efficiency, because the lower the efficiency, the more air to, you have to blow through the system to get the same amount of oxygen through. It's inevitable. So if you look at a, a qualitative equation, I'll put it over here, the airflow rate of the blower, okay, that the blower is operating at, is a function of the efficiency you have. So the higher the efficiency, the lower the airflow rate you need. And it's a function of the oxygen requirement. So those are a function of something else. The, the alpha is a function of the wastewater, okay? More contaminant in the, in the wastewater, the lower the SRT in the wastewater, number of considerations, alpha may be lowered. And the type of aerator, the type of diffuser technology you have, dictates what the type of SOT you have, and also the type of geometry you have, the type of density on the floor you have. SOT is much affected by having one strip or one disc or many of them in the same area. So you need to be aware of this, and the manufacturer is transparent about educating you about the advantages of putting more diffusers or or not, and so it's a capital investment for a better efficiency or a capital savings for less efficiency, so more operating savings or more operating cost down the road. And the oxygen requirement is what goes in and you need to treat, so you haven't, you haven't got much leverage there. The, po the point I want to make here is um, right off the bat you notice that the oxygen requirement there, it's calculated, you know that it's the flow rate times the load, and that changes every hour of the day. So the air flow rate you need from your blowers is not constant. Even though the blowers, you might like the idea that they run at a constant speed because they're old and it's, you know, at a constant speed, it was just the old-fashioned way to do it. There are a lot of blowers that they can tune up and down the air. They have variable frequency drives, guide vanes. We have a lot of blower technology nowadays that we can use to tune up and down the air to meet the oxygen requirement curve. The oxygen requirement curve changes every hour of the day, right? And so, so the blower should match that. But as the blower changes the airflow, the diffuser efficiency changes with that airflow. So we should understand the dynamic implication of this because I will demonstrate through some of these slides that in some hours of the day, 
you spend much more in energy than some other hours because when things go wrong, they all pile up all together at 3 p.m. It's just an inevitable condition of wastewater treatment, okay? So you need to be aware of this. This is a study that uh, Mike and I and uh, a few other people together, we worked on in, uh, in Simi Valley. And what we did with the 24-hour tests, and I'll show you some pictures of some of the 24-hour tests we did. And as part of the 24-hour test, we measured alpha SOTE. We had the SOTE values from the manufacturer. And uh, so we could calculate the alpha. And we, had, we measured the airflow uh, several times uh, during the day. So it's like, you know, more than once an hour. And uh, we also had uh, with samples, grab samples at each time with profiles of the oxygen demand. So we knew how much contaminant was in the water. And uh, we created this... Uh, this, uh, this graph where we have the airflow rate on the left hand side vertical axis and the COD on the horizontal. And you see that the airflow rate increases when you have more oxygen demand because your controller says there is not enough DO, put more air because there is, the DO is depressed by more oxygen demand. The oxygen is being demanded by the oxygen demand, right? So it's disappearing, so you put more air to supply more oxygen. Well, you put more air, alpha goes down. And your alpha, there is a big window there from like 0.3 to 0.6, something like that. So I know it's, that's the denominator of your blower power curve. So it's twice as much power over that time. And it's not exactly twice as much, it's much worse than that. Because at the moment where you're at the peak load, you need more airflow, right? So it's twice as much power per unit air discharge, but you need a lot more air. So it's twice the multiplier times the larger number. Okay, so I'll show you later some curves. This amplifies big time. Why is alpha going down? Well, because when you have more contaminants, you have more of the surfactants that are freely available to float about the wastewater, and there is a fixed amount of biomass in, the, in a given day. You can change the sludge retention time and the MLSS concentration over a year, but you cannot change it over 24 hours. It's just, it's not that responsive. But every 24 hours, the load may change twofold. And so you have a very variable amount of free flowing surfactants that can land on your bubbles at some hours of the day or are more likely to be sorbed onto the biomass at some other hours of the day. And so those surfactants depress gas transfer, as Mike had introduced. You put soap in the water, the bubbles become stiffer, smaller, and they transfer a lot less gas. So that becomes very detrimental to your power bill. And uh, guess what? Uh, most of the carbonaceous matter that goes down the drain and we don't like for gas transfer is soap because you wash your hands, you wash your head, you take a shower, run the dishwasher, run the washing machine, the surfactants everywhere. And they're not the majority of that COD, but there are a fraction that migrates very quickly to bubbles because their nature is to be both polar and non-polar. So they can dissolve into fat, but air is non-polar and water is. So they love to stick to that interface to put their hydrophobic tail into the bubbles and to put the polar head into the water. Once they stick there, you can get them out because they're chemically very stable there and they form foam, so on and so forth. <clears throat> and I'm gonna reiterate the idea that Mike said that tail of two tanks, two plants in parallel, different SRT or MCRT, you can call it SRT or MCRT, it's the same thing, is the mean cell retention time, the average drudge, sludge retention time. So if you have plants that have a higher retention time, while there's less surfactants available, the food to mass ratio is lower, right? Because you have the same amount of food coming in, but there's more mass, biomass. Bacteria tend to be more competitive for food and they cannot store this food as little polymers that make them so sticky. And so at a lower MCRT, when the plant is maybe non-nitrifying, you have bacteria that are stickier, they form more biofilm, and they're more aggressive in fouling diffusers in general. This is an observation that we have observed for a very long time. And uh, this graph was compiled. It's, I didn't put the point to, to not scare you with all the, the scatter. There's a lot of scatter because there's a lot of site-specific data, okay? But, uh, you have to understand that this graph was done with 112 different off gas testing in 21 different treatment plants around the country. It wasn't like a single installation. So it, this is uh, something that goes beyond the type of process configuration you have, the temperature of the wastewater. When the MCRT is lower, plants, the diffusers tend to foul a lot more. And it's not due to the diffuser technology. The same diffuser may be installed in two plants nearby with similar wastewater. It was the case here in Orange County. Two plants seven miles apart. One was fouling big time, one wasn't fouling at all almost. And it was almost the same wastewater. But the MCRT was substantially different. One was very low, one was long. So the biology played a major role in the very same diffuser technology, geometry, layout, airflows were very similar in the design, but the low SRT, it was a very different type of fouling. 
And uh, this is in a paper we published uh, a few years back, and it will make available all the papers you might be interested in by just sending us an email. I, my email address will appear at the last slide, and you're more than welcome to send me an email anytime, and I'll distribute the PDFs if you do not have access to the papers. But this just shows on the horizontal axis, uh, it's difficult to read from the back, but on the left panel, on the horizontal axis of the airflow per unit diffuser area. So that's the flux of air through the diffuser. And the, the, on the right half of this, uh, this graph, you have this large retention time, the MCRT. So <clears throat> the flux, as the flux increases, both alpha and alpha CTE decrease. The flux increases when? When you have more load, that's why alpha goes down, okay? And when you have more load, you increase the flux because you need to de re release more air to supply more oxygen. Releasing more air to a fixed area diffuser produces larger bubbles. So larger bubbles float faster and they have a lower surface to volume ratio. So two disadvantages there. That's why it's always better to have more diffusers at a lower flux because the bubbles come out smaller and they travel slower and they have more surface area for transfer. On the other hand, those bubbles offer more surface to accumulate these surfactants. So if you in increase the sludge retention time, now the bacteria can solve the surfactant before they get on the bubble. And so by increasing the sludge retention time on the right hand side, you see there is an increase in the transfer efficiency and in the alpha because there's less surfactants available. And having less surfactants available means that there is a better efficiency. So you need less air in proportion to dissolve the same amount of oxygen. So it is true that you need more air in absolute number, more oxygen in absolute number when you have a higher oxygen requirements because you have a longer MCRT. You need more air in absolute number, but it's relatively more efficient to dissolve the same amount of air. Okay, so each SCFM of air transfer more pounds of oxygen, even though you need more in total. So we did a comparative study comparing a, a plant that does only carbon oxidation, just ammonia bypass, a plant that does only nitrification, and a plant that does nitrification and denitrification. And uh, this was based on our observation at Glendale, uh, one of the uh, LA city plants, and a number of observation, a tale of two tanks in Contra Costa County. And, uh, and then we laid out an economic model. Turns out that on average, in a warm climate like Southern California, if you spend a dollar to do treatment in a carbon oxidation plant, it costs about 88 to 90 cents to do nitrification and denitrification. But it will cost you a dollar 15 to do nitrification only. Because in nitrification only, you need a lot more oxygen. But in denitrification, you have this selector reactor up front that absorbs all the surfactants before there are any bubbles in the system. So they do you a great favor by removing these surfactants and using those as a carbon source for denitrification. So you remove the nitrogen and you get a better efficiency. So two birds with the same stone, it's a, it's a rather advantageous uh, type of uh, configuration. So if you have to nitrify, must denitrify, okay? Take home this message. Don't just nitrify. It's always better to nitrify and denitrify. So I'll uh, briefly show you how a clean water test looks like when you do it in the lab. Small tank, this is not a tank the, the a manufacturer will use for certifying results. But for the lab, this is great because here's a window. We can take pictures on the bubble size distribution. And in the very same tank, we can put diffusers that are harvested from the field. So we can test in clean water, fouled diffusers. And also we bring this tank. We have it currently at the Irvine Ranch Water District and the tank is continuously circulating mixed liquor. So I'm doing a process test in the very same geometry. So the geometry effect cancels out. And that's good for me because I want to see the relative effect of the process water to clean water. But if I had to give you a design number, I couldn't use this because it's not an absolute value that I can use, okay? But this, this will give me the alpha and the F because both are tested in the same tank and there are ratios, okay? So this is a paper that Mike and I and a gang of other people published recently using a site-specific test to identify an alpha and a fouling factor for this very plant. Because the manufacturer will give you the SOTE, the clean water value in clean water for day one, when it's brand new. Then you have processed water and you have fouling, and you do not know how to expect those. But designing a treatment plant takes two or three years, it doesn't take overnight. So in those two or three years of time, you can hire an independent person for a thousand to a percent of the cost of the project to install one of these tanks and circulate sludge in the existing mixed liquor, okay, where you're going to be designing your new aeration system, your retrofit or your new design, okay, and you just install some candidate diffuser or several manufacturers that you think, discussing with your design firm or your design engineer, 
that this will be the candidate diffusers, and you let them run. You let them run for a year or so and see, watch their fouling, what happens. So after a year, you have data that you can feed into the design effort that has been ongoing in parallel, and these are data that are site-specific for your case. So you get the data from the manufacturer with a warranty in clean water, and you can adjust them to your specific case instead of relying on the experience or the gut feeling of, a, of an engineer that based on his or her experience will say, this is the alpha that I feel comfortable with. Well, what, about, what if I give you the alpha for that very case? So the site-specific test is always recommended because it takes away the liability or risking a number that may be inflated, so it could be much larger aeration system that you need, and if it's not, you don't have enough capacity to deliver oxygen. So carbon oxidation may still work if your system is, is not uh, well oxygenated. But sure, that uh, nitrification is not going to go to completion. So you're going to have too much nitrogen going out. And your clarifier is not going to settle well if the system is anoxic. So your operator is going to have the headache to treat, to have to treat the water with a clarifier that doesn't work well. And that's the worst nightmare. So you really want to have enough oxygen. Obviously, when you want to have enough oxygen, you tend to over-design over the system. But over design the system means a bigger power bill forever. Because you cannot just say, okay, well, I'm going to turn the blower half off. Because the blower is just that size. So unless you have a lot of blowers, tiny blowers, which is not going to happen, okay, you cannot turn all of them up and down or on or off. So in the clean water test, you put the diffusers in. And then uh, what you do, you just let the air go out. And at the very beginning here, you have... Uh, the curve is at saturation, and you add an oxygen scavenger, a chemical that just takes the oxygen to zero. And whenever you are done with, a, with, a, with this uh, chemical scavenging the oxygen, now the, the chemical is exhausted, oxygen can redissolve in the clean water. So you watch that curve going back to saturation, going up. The feeding parameter for that curve is that oxygen transfer coefficient. You stop when you're close to saturation, run a program that is available from uh, ASE, which is a standardized uh, way to do it, so everyone does it the same way. Click run, and it gives you SOTE, SOTR, KLA. So the design values for clean water. Of course, if you do it a certified test, you want to have a witness, a large tank that is representative of like a full-scale installation, more than just one diffuser, of course, because you want to have a representative density of a floor coverage, and you want to have many probes to make sure that you're doing it right. But in essence, this is what it is. It's an unsteady state test that you do with a chemical. And then... You go to the field, and of course, in the field, you cannot just tell the treatment plant, hold on, can you just stop the treatment plant because I got to add a chemical, I got to do my test for a day. Because the wastewater keeps flowing in. So we need a test that is non-invasive. And the off-cast is what it is. It's non-invasive. You just measure what is being released at the top of each tank, and that's what's released is less than what you put in. Because you put in 21% oxygen, what comes out is less, and the difference is what is transferred. So that's how you calculate the oxygen transfer efficiency in processed water. And that image there will introduce a little bit of, the, of some photographs that I will show you. So um, the aeration efficiency test in this animation here will show you that uh, in a treatment plant, you have the air being released, and that's me trying to save you energy, right? And that's your oxygen transfer efficiency is the gas transfer coefficient times uh, some other parameters times the DO you need or whatever. So that's how much dollars you spend every day to deliver this oxygen. So my job is to try to save you money. So how do I do it? Carefully. I go there and I place a hood on top of the tank, okay, on top of the floating water, get the gas out and measure it in a device that tells me what's the oxygen in that gas stream. I know I put in air, and so I also measure the velocity of the gas coming out, which is yeah, back calculated as the flow rate under that hood, and I measure several points around the tank. So I show you a picture. This is Simi Valley, actually. Mike took this picture of me while I was doing the testing with him. And over there, there is the whole uh, outfit. You don't see very much contrast here from the back, but uh, when you... You look at it uh, uh, on the file, you see it better. But this is the, the basin there. It's, uh, the, the floor is covered with diffusers. And that's a floating hood over there. And you have an off gas analyzer on the right. And the hood has a hose. It's like a pool cleaning hose. Okay? And it collects the gas. And the gas goes to the analyzer. We take part of it. We measure what's in it. And most of it goes through the analyzer and tells me the velocity. The velocity times the flow. The area of this uh, hose tells me the flow rate. And I know the flow rate under that hood that is captured. We measure very many points around, so we can have a flow-weighted average of the tank, and also we can have a profile of efficiency. Because, you know, closer to the head of the tank, you need more diffusers because you have more oxygen demand. At the end, you need less diffusers because most of the oxygen demand is being resolved to CO2, right? So the traditional off gas setup, there will be an off gas analyzer, there will be a hood over there, and a traditional guy with a PhD doing the analysis. And, but that's basically the equation. 
The guy with a PhD uh, well, is, was there because the old analyzer was manual. There were a lot of consideration to make it work. Most importantly, that hood weighs just about as much as that Rolls Royce, okay? And when I was a student, I was always pissed because I had to lift it, and I didn't want to do that. So I want to devise something that wouldn't force me to be there to take the readings manually, and I wouldn't have to schlep about this hood around the treatment plant, in and out of the truck. So I'll show you a picture of the 24-hour test in Simi Valley. One of the pitfalls of testing is that you might be stuck there when uh, your professor says, okay, we need to do a 24-hour test in the rigid California winters, okay? And so we did this. Uh, I presented this in Michigan. It's like, that's spring. It's only 41 Fahrenheit, right? But uh, well, even though in California we always have summer year-round, it's really unpleasant to be at a treatment plant on Saturday night. I'm telling you this, okay? So taking measurements every 15 or 30 minutes during the night, no fun. So what I did, I said, like, I'm making my mission to make an automated analyzer that is a guy with a PhD less, right? So here it is. I'm no longer in the picture. I'm giving you the presentation while this is installed at OCSD. That's a picture from OCSD. And uh, we got a, a couple of uh, concerts from the state, the California Energy Commission, and from Southern California Edison to produce these uh, prototypes and deploy them in different treatment plants. We have them currently at uh, Whittier Narrows, LA County, San Jose Creek, LA County, uh, or, um, Orange County Sanitation District, Irvine Ranch Water District. And as soon as we started this, a lot of people all over, they started asking, can we have the, the specs for the prototype? And uh, it's public domain, it's on my website, you can download the specs and build your own. Okay, there's no patent attached to it, so everyone can save energy. And uh, um, this is uh, the way it works. There's an off-gas analyzer that pulls uh, uh, the, the off-gas from the hood, it goes to the analyzer and it gives in continuously the airflow rate and the oxygen transfer efficiency. And there's a three-way valve with a relay that at times goes with atmospheric air, there's a vent that picks up some atmospheric air, and at times goes to off-gas. So each reading it's calibrated back to air, so I never need to calibrate the instrument because every reading calibrates back to atmospheric air. So this gives me get these very nice uh, curves over time, over the hours of the day and over the months of the year, which is really important. Question? Is there much of a trick with the hood to make sure it's still representative of the airflow? Say if, if the back pressure of your sampling system is, is uh, high enough that the, the, air, the bubbles would tend to skirt around it? Very good question. So the question is, what if uh, there is back pressure in the instrument, okay? And um, the, the plume of bubbles filling up the hood, there is back pressure, so you have to skirt around the, the hood, and you are not representative of, of, of how much is actually being fed to the hood. Well, what we did is we over-designed the size of the hose to discharge, and the hose goes through the instrument, and through a flow pipe, there is no obstruction. It's uh, typically is a one and a half inch pipe, okay, for an 18 to 24 square foot um, uh, modular hood. The hoods there is made with uh, plastic containers. It's modular. You can add as many as you like to, to cover a certain area. So this hose goes through a flow pipe, and from the flow pipe, there is a little suction hole that sucks about half a percent of the flow into the instrument to tell me the concentration. But the flow is measured with a hot water anemometer. It's not measured with a rotometer, so there's no pressure drop. It just, it's a hot water the size of a needle into a pipe that's one and a half inch in diameter. And uh, if you put your hand, you can actually feel the airflow going out. So you, we don't obstruct the flow on purpose to avoid exactly that good observation. So this is uh, uh, a 24 hour results, just to show you uh, an idea. Whenever uh, you have uh, uh, over the 24 hours, whenever you have the airflow rate being very high, you have uh, a very low OTE and vice versa because you have a high efficiency when you have low air, because the efficiency and the flux of the air going through these diffusers is inversely proportional. Higher airflow, larger bubbles, low efficiency, right? And vice versa. And over the same 24 hours, we can calculate if you get grab samples of COD, okay? You grab sample of COD, or you have like a, some sort of auto sampler, you get your curve for COD and your alpha, you can calculate live because the alpha SOTE is the number you get from the field live, okay? The SOTE, you have the curve from the manufacturer that is it's part of a warranty. That number, it's kosher. It was done in a clean water test according to protocol. So you can have a spreadsheet that calculates alpha for each point live in front of you, okay? As you feed the alpha SOTE because SOTE is a number that you already have for any airflow rates in the range of operation. And so whenever you have a high a spiking load, there is a drop in alpha, you see? Inversely proportional, like I said before. And uh, this is a week of monitoring. And uh, this is done at one of the local plants here. My students go out there about uh, once every two weeks just to replace the consumable in the analyzer, which is some dry ride to clean up uh, the airflow coming in. 
but uh, the analyzer runs on its own. And uh, you can build your own for like four or five thousand dollars of parts, okay? And uh, you know, a plant of the magnitude of like Orange County spend hundreds of thousands of dollars of power like a week, you know? So, I mean, it's $5,000 is the cost of like the probe. Like every plant you see has the probes all over. And roughly that's the order of magnitude of cost to equip a plant with probes. You can add also efficiency analyzers. So in, we envisioned this in a few years then in the control room, you see airflow rate, tank one, airflow rate, tank two, and you see the efficiency there. So you know if something is going wrong right there, you don't have to call the guy with a PhD to come tell you. They will give you the power and the credit for taking action to save energy. And you might know right away, the efficiency is going down big time. Maybe it's time to clean. But if you don't know the efficiency decline, you don't have enough material to make a decision on when it's time to clean, right? So on this graph here, you see the OT, the temperature, the flux, and uh, this is a 24-hour calculation. This is uh, back again at Simi Valley. 24-hour calculation, what is the ocean demand curve and the ocean transfer from the ocean analyzer? So you see that a couple hours of the day, you might have a little deficiency here. You don't, the demand exceeds the transfer here, this area and this area. A couple hours a day is no big deal, provided over 24 hours you don't break the permit, right? But this is a huge amount of energy you're wasting because you don't have the capacity to tune down your blower, for example, okay? The way it's designed. So this gives you some information that uh, when it's time to retrofit a blower, you might have to think about something that is more tunable, okay? And this is something that uh, with, the, with this type of uh, technology you can, uh, you can actually quantify because you can make a case based on the area of that is energy, right? Kilowatt hours. So that's dollars. You can make a business case, how many dollars I save to abate the cost of this more expensive piece of equipment that allows me to tune up and down the airflow. And if you want to look at what happens over a long period of time, this is a, a, adapted, one student, a student of mine adapted this from a book that Mike and I co-wrote. And uh, we did a survey of all these different uh, um, data we had from the past, and, and they were published from others. And we have fine port diffusers, turbines, coarse bubbles, surface aerators. And you know, there is a big, a big uh, advantage to a fine port diffusers in terms of efficiency compared to other technology. So the problem comes if, if fouls, and their efficiency drops down. And the other technologies, you know, they are legitimate, they have a, re a reason to exist because you might need so much oxygen that the fine bubble diffuser, you might not be able to put enough bubbles in the floor of a tank to supply enough oxygen if you have a huge oxygen demand, like an industrial treatment. But the efficiency is very high and it goes down and you have the opportunity to bring it up again by cleaning. While the other ones, the efficiency wasn't very, low, very high, okay, and it stays the same over time. So the fouling factor is one when you don't have any change, but it's the ratio of two numbers that might not be very high. Okay, it's like if I told you that the mile per gallon of your car won't change with time without telling you really how many miles per gallon you get. So if you get 50 today and in a year from now you get 30, oh my gosh, it's a, such a steep decline. But if you have 15 today and you get 15 next year, there's no decline, but it's still 15 versus 30, right? So you need to put it in perspective in absolute value and in relative value. So when you compare different technology, you need to know the absolute value. But once you have your own technology, you want to know your relative value because your power cost is going to go up. You're not going to change technology in a year from now unless you are going to be, you no, know, rip it up and redo it from scratch. You cannot just replace a coarse bubble diffuser with a clean bubble, a uh, fine bubble diffuser by just going in the tank and screwing in new diffusers. It costs a lot of money and it might not work. So you really need to think about it ahead of time and be prepared for this. And what happens in terms of fouling is that this is a, uh, diffuser operating curve, okay? So the manufacturer will give you this in clean water. In clean water, they give you a curve with the different airflow rates they, they give you in the warranty. There is a, like a medium range airflow that they like, and then there is a minimum one and a maximum one. And you operate outside that range, uh, you're on your own, because uh, you know, they feel comfortable that this is the way that it's optimized. That's the way they've developed their technology. And this is the range of efficiency. They feel comfortable in telling you this is the way it is. So you test this in processed water, and you get a curve that is scaled times alpha, okay? So you get a curve like this. The area, that, or that rectangle, that's your oxygen transfer rate, okay? In mass per unit time. It's proportional to that, because that's the airflow times the efficiency of transfer. So the product of the two tells you how many pounds of oxygen you transfer, okay? Times some conversion. Over time, this curve will decline because things, you know, foul over time. They just lose efficiency. So you're tempted to think, okay, well, I'm gonna go down from this point to this point, and I'm losing efficiency. But you don't really go down that way because when you design the plant, you design to meet a certain amount of oxygen requirement, right? So pound of oxygen per hour, that's what you need to dissolve. 
So you design based on the rectangle. So you need to have a rectangle of the same area because the same load is coming in, right? So you don't do this on purpose, but uh, your DO controller tells that the DO is going down, so the blower has to ramp up the speed or one more blower kicks in, so the airflow goes up because one more blower kicks in, you have a fixed amount of diffuser, the airflow rate for each diffuser goes up, right? So your efficiency doesn't just go up, doesn't just go down by this yellow arrow, but slow, slowly creeps along this operating line and this is what you lose, okay? This is the difference in efficiency. Because you lose efficiency and you need to put more air, which makes you lose even more efficiency, it's a catch-22. So you need to be aware of that. At the same time, you have the airflow rate and you have a pressure drop, okay? The manufacturer will give you the pressure drop in clean water. They, in day one, you put it in, pro in processed water, it's the same number, okay? Because there's no fouling. There's no effect of surfactants or contaminants on the pressure drop, okay? So you put it in the processed water, and uh, this is the, uh, your original value at day one. And over time, that number may go up, okay? May or may not. It depends on the diffusers. So that's why a site-specific test is always recommended. That number goes up. And it doesn't go up this way, because remember, we had to jack up the airflow to come up with the, you know, more, the same amount of oxygen with less efficiency. So it really goes up that way, OK? So that's what you should expect. This increase from this point, not there, but here. So you have this premium discharge pressure. If you start at you know, four inches of water depth of pressure drop, and you go up to six inches, yeah, it's a 50% increase, but it's only two inches. It's negligible. But if you have a 50% increase starting at 30 inches, gosh, you have 15 extra inches, okay? 15 inches is more than a foot of water. It's like if you took the tank, you just flooded by another foot, okay? I mean, you need to budget this extra pressure ahead of time when you design the blower, when you pick the blower. So over time, things, you know, decline in, 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 uh, in efficiency. And on the vertical axis here, we have uh, the, the percent uh, transport per, per foot, okay, or per meter. And of course, the error bars are humongous. You can put an elephant through these error bars. And the point of this error bar is to show you there's a very big variability of data sets. And the reason is because there are so many site-specific variables that you cannot take a number from one plant and say, OK, it's going to go from this value to this value. Yeah, on average, it's going to go from this value to this value. On average, in the United States, cars do 20 miles per gallon. But how many of you have a car that always does 20 miles per gallon? Sometimes it does 20 miles per gallon. Sometimes it doesn't, OK? And sometimes you may never, because your car may be well above 20 or well below 20 all the time. So the message of this is that on average, most of the, of the loss in performance occurs in the first two years. And then it kind of stabilizes, because after two years, OK, we have 50 more minutes. Um, OK. Uh, after two years, the biofilm is structured in a way that is not going to grow indefinitely, OK? It grows to a mature state, and there is an equilibrium. Some is left off, and some forms back, okay? But in general, at the very beginning, when you have a bare, brand new diffuser and the biofilm starts ripening, that's when you lose the most efficiency. So if you have to clean, clean every year if you can. And if you have the spare tankage, don't wait more than two years. But sometimes having the spare tank or having the crew out and be able to gather the manpower or the cost to get in the tank is not, is not possible. So you should know this ahead of time. And Mike showed you this, the pre-cleaning and the post-cleaning, you see? Just Tank top hosing does miracles, but you need to have the spare tank to dewater this one. So think about it. And this is a picture that I want to show you, and we call it half and half. Ben Lu took this picture when he and I were graduate students in Mike's lab. And what he did, he took a diffuser from uh, Orange County Sanitation District. It's a nine inch uh, EPDM membrane. And with a lab brush, he cleaned it three times, just the way a, an operator will go in and with a brush will clean the diffuser. He only clean half. So look at the half that it's clean, okay? Look at the difference of two random bubbles in size, magnified to the same extent, you see? There's more and small bubbles on one side, but just brushing it, no high tech. And uh, that's, a, that's a major improvement. So think about this. If uh, you have smaller bubbles uh, you, and more bubbles, it means you also have less pressure drop on that side of the diffuser because there's less biofilm to obstruct, right? So remember the blowers do not compress the air, they blow it. And this is an installation in the East Coast where the blower power is such that it costs $300 an hour when you can discharge the air. But if you can't, you can't. Because if this is limiting, well, that's it. The, the diffusers act as plugs. So you need to remember this. And this is the, the bubbles uh, at the very beginning, with another picture of the one before, right? The half and half. And then this is when it's 
this is just minimum discharge just to, to photograph the bubbles. But when they are operating in one CFM, this is what happens. You see on the left, you have all these like necklaces of bubbles coming out. So a necklace of bubbles transfer has less area than the bubbles in a plume. Because really the area for transfer is the cylinder that envelops the bubbles. It's not each bubble. Like, you know, when you see the, the car races, there's a car drafted behind the other one because there is depression, right? That means that there is not very much air in between the two cars. That's when the other one gets drafted. It's the same happens with bubbles. So not having enough water in between the bubbles because of the depression causes not having enough transfer, okay? And that depresses a lot, gas transfer. So this is the result um, summarized uh, for like a year of a site-specific study. And a site-specific study means that we install the tank there and we let a number of diffusers foul for a year and we measure them every single week. Now we know that we can measure them every single month and we'll still do the same thing. But you see that the efficiency drops based on the airflow you have. So if you have an initial airflow that is very high, your efficiency doesn't drop as much. That means that the airflow very high means that the efficiency was low and stays low. Okay? But the airflow was very low because you have a lot of diffusers with a low flux to have a high efficiency. That drops very quickly because low flux means low scouring of the bubbles from the biofilm. The biofilm grows faster. So the higher you want the efficiency and the more maintenance you need to commit to have in return for this efficiency that pays you back. Right? And the same for the pressure drop. Okay? I got to go quickly here. So I'm going to show you quickly a picture of uh, high-tech cleaning. Okay? Uh, you don't need high-tech cleaning. You need cleaning. Okay? Any cleaning will do better than no cleaning. So do one thing. If you want to do an installation where you have fine bubble diffusers, clean them or don't buy them. That's it. So if you look at the, uh, you know, the energy footprint, that's a, that's a pie chart from MOP32. It's a publication from WEF. And it replicates what uh, Mike and I have been publishing for quite some time before. That aeration is the largest uh, contributor to the energy footprint. Pumping is site specific, so it can never really be taken into consideration. Some plants have oceanic discharge, some don't, but aeration is present at every plant. And on average in the United States, a, a plant takes 1600 kilowatt hours per million gallon treated. Aeration is eight or 900 on average, okay? So it's half your power bill. You say 10%, you say 5% of your power bill as a whole, okay? So every percent point you shave here, it's a lot of money because 1% of a lot is a lot. If I told you I raise your taxes by 1% next year, you won't be happy, right? Okay, so imagine again 1% saving on a huge power bill. And if you look at the energy footprint of a treatment plant, one minute, two minutes, okay. Aeration is the energy guzzler here. And then you have some disinfection maybe, some for a, from the digestion, but mostly is aeration. And we have a paper, we did a whole analysis, we'll share it with you if you want it. And over time, you have your efficiency on the left, it was alpha, okay? And on the right is uh, your um, uh, operating parameters, uh, it's a lump of uh, operating parameters, okay? But what you have, you have new diffusers, use diffusers, and clean diffusers. So you can recap, recoup a lot, of, a lot from cleaning, because from new one, you go to the used one and old, and then you just clean it and go back up, okay? So that's... Uh, gives you a, a big time advantage of cleaning. And this is uh, the net present worth um, calculation for, uh, for the, uh, the, 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 the worth of cleaning. So this is the power loss from day one. So day one, this is the amount of power you wasted. So this is just your regular power bill. And you keep losing and losing and losing un until some point, your power loss equals the cost of cleaning. So beyond that, you just really want to waste money. Okay? So whenever your power loss equals cleaning, it's time to clean. Because you're cleaning, it becomes from that moment on more profitable to clean than to keep paying the extra power bill. Okay? Because the power bill will compound to cost more than getting to a tank. Cleaning may cost 20 or 30 grand, but the power bill may be far exceeding that. And the blower power, it's a formula 556A on the Metcalf and Eddie book. I'm teaching the design class, so I memorize even in which page it is. Okay? So that's a, the power of the blower. It's proportional to the airflow rate and the discharge pressure. That means that with time, it's inversely proportional of alpha FSOT because this is a denominator of the airflow rate. And it's proportional to the pressure drop and the pressure increase over time, okay? So the less efficient you are, the more power you need. The more pressure drop, the a little more power you need. So two things compound against you. So you really need to be aware of this. So to wrap this up, here is the picture from MOP32, confirms what we just said, aeration, huge. And this is uh, the dynamics that I wanted to give you the take-home message. 
So my former student, Reza Zubani, is now a postdoc associate with us, has been doing dynamic modeling of tripping operation for his whole career as a graduate student and, and is now doing it uh, as our associate. And what he did is he looked at the different curves over 24 hours in a treatment plant, in this application particularly. So that's the flow, the flow rate in MGD on a plant. So you have more flow in the afternoon typically, right? You, you, we have been, you know, we've grown to understand this as most plants. And with more flow, we get more concentration, okay? And so your alpha goes down because there's more concentration, right? So whenever there's high concentration, alpha goes down. It's an inverse sinusoid. And then your OTE, the oxygen transfer efficiency, goes down when you have more load because you need more air. And the load is the product of these two, okay? So these two, these two panels here, where the inverse proportionality, these two panels go in the denominator of the airflow curve, remember, and the energy. So your energy requirement peak way more than the other peaks, and the energy footprint over time, that's, uh, you know, the CO2 emission of the energy goes up here even higher. I want to show you that if you have a 1.5 peaking factor, a very typical peaking factor, you have uh, about a little bit more than 1.5 in drop in alpha and OTE because the product of the two causes uh, an increase in airflow that is much more than 1.5, right? Because the product of two sinusoids amplifies them. And so your energy footprint in terms of kilowatt hours per pound treated for that hour goes up much higher. Remember one thing, that at 3 p.m. power costs are much higher than 3 a.m. So if your energy footprint goes up fourfold in that hour, your power cost go goes up more than fourfold in that hour. Because in the afternoon, Edison charges you a peak, a premium peak power cost, okay? So remember that. And uh, this is uh, the, um, a reading from our automated analyzer based on the lower curve. In our spreadsheet live, we compile what is the actual energy power drawn and energy consumption for the blower for 24 hours. So you see that if you have here, you know, the, um, here is the, the um, which one is which? The, the power drawn, okay, this is the power drawn with very big peaks of power drawn, and that's the cumulative energy. The power drawn might have big peaks, which may draw you to the higher uh, power demand charge, okay, which you're going to carry for probably a quarter, and you have to pay for it. So you really want to be aware of it, and maybe try to have a strategy to equalize your flow, or cap the amount of power is drawn, have different uh, dynamic response to your operations. So I want to wrap this up, okay, because I'm about to be kicked off. The first thing I want to say is that well, the process layout influences your aeration efficiency. Remember, high SRT, low SRT, okay? Alpha is dynamic. So whenever people call me and they say, hi, I'm doing this design. Can you give me an alpha over the phone? My hand is already half the way hanging up, okay? Because, I mean, give me a break. You cannot give a number over the phone. It's so site specific and it's dynamic. You need to know what is the peak. You cannot just give me an average. Because on average, cars do 20 miles per gallon. But uh, try to go uphill. So... The 24-hour observations become absolutely crucial to understand, uh, to understand uh, what you have to design for, what's your efficiency. And one thing I tell you is that it's always good to have a separation of roles. You as um, an operator, you as a design engineer, you should not take the liability of interpreting the manufacturer data without having, having someone independent from you to help you out and evaluate this data. Because this will cost you a thousand of percent in cost. Okay, but takes the liability off your back because somebody who understands this and can do a site specific test can give you a number rather than you make up a number based on your feeling or your expectation. And then if something was wrong, well, you can only blame a mirror. So be very careful and make sure that you have different separation of roles all the time. And I want to thank all my associates that helped me out over these years to publish this plethora of papers that I'll be very happy to, the, to uh, send out if people want it. And uh, here is the, my email address. Please send me an email anytime you like. If you go on my website over there, you can find also all the specs about uh, the offcast analyzers. And uh, there's a specs on the offcast analyzer, modular hoods, uh, joints uh, with sizes and uh, uh, component parts. They're public domain, and I don't make any money in promoting them. If you want them, build yourself and do it. Uh, you need to learn how to interpret the data, OK? Even if I gave everyone as a as a treat today, an EKG machine, you wouldn't really be able to read that scribble, right? Unless you understand what it means. So make sure you interpret the data correctly or you ask someone independent from you to interpret the data for you. Thank you very much.